My name is Stefan Johansson, and I would like to say welcome to all of you to this first 99 Nikki webinar. It's uh, uh, a first experience for us, and we are uh, astonished by the great interest. Uh, there may be up to 400 people attending this webinar, which is quite fantastic. And I'm sure that is because we have Nathan C. Sundgren from Texas, US, who we First of all, we'd like to say warmly welcome to, and you will be sharing uh, about delayed cord clamping, which is, has become a really hot topic in neonatal care. Please, please Francesco. Okay, hi from uh, Francesco. I'm here in uh, Vienna, Austria, and I'm also very much looking forward to Nathan's lecture. And I just want to keep uh, you up to date on some housekeeping notes. So after the lecture, we'll have a Q&A session and you can either raise your hand or we'll look at uh, the questions that people put into the chat. So if you have a question during the lecture, just put it into the chat and we'll um, answer the questions at the very end. We'll have enough time to answer hopefully a lot of questions. And we also have a small poll uh, prepared so we'll have that at the end of the lecture as well just to get a bit of feedback of how things are all over the world and that makes me hand over to Nathan so please go ahead maybe introduce yourself Nathan and I was muted as I was starting to introduce myself uh, so on now I'm Nathan Sunger and I'm happy to talk uh, uh, I'm gonna share my screen so that we can uh, kind of get going. Um, and so uh, I am in a, uh, let me make sure I get that there, okay. And then one other thing I wanna bring up. Um, just make sure see the chat list. Okay, um, so we'll get going. Uh, so cord clamping, I called it good to the last drop. Uh, for those that you don't know, that's, uh, that's a uh, coffee company here in the United States um, that's uh, uh, been around for decades. This is their ad slogan. And um, I sort of felt like uh, we needed an ad slogan for uh, delayed cord clamping. That's, uh, that's my starting vote. Um, but we're going to be talking about today, and I guess you could say, why am I giving this talk? At least I sort of think that. Why am I giving this talk? Uh, but I did make a video about delayed cord clamping, and I actually posted it first to the 99 NICU website, sort of asked for input. Um, several of you gave me great input. This is my website on uh, 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 the YouTube channel, Tech Sun Neo Ed. Um, and what I want to say about this, if you've already seen this video, I'm going to be covering slightly different ground. So hopefully this doesn't feel like a big repeat of what I've already discussed. Um, and if you haven't seen the video, that's fine too. I hope you get a lot of information out of this video about this webinar, but you might want to go check out the video afterwards because it covers, again, slightly different ground. But this is also a really good point for me to stop and say, that channel is not monetized for me. I don't make any money off of it. Whether you go see it or not doesn't, doesn't uh, benefit me financially. And in fact, I have no other conflict of interest to declare, no financial um, conflicts to, to discuss about delayed cord clamping, about anything I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, my objectives today are really to describe the physiology that occurs between birth and cord clamping, to describe the evidence of risk and benefits to delayed cord clamping, and be honest, we're going to spend a lot more time on benefits than risks, um, although those are really important to know and understand as well. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how to get it going and tell a little bit more of a personal story about how it worked out here at the hospital. Um, so physiology, this is where I'm going to spend a little bit, the bulk of my time probably. Um, you guys all know fetal circulation, and I'm just a quick review here. Um, we have a placental circuit involved when we're, when we're still inside um, the uterus, uh, where the oxygenated blood is coming back, and it's able to both fill the right heart and the left side of the heart because there's a foramen ovale open. And this is a good thing because of the right heart, most of the blood is shunted across the ductus arteriosus and doesn't go through the lungs. So there's a minority, a very small amount of blood returning from the lungs that's actually coming to fill the left heart, whereas the majority of the blood filling the left heart is coming from the placenta and the body. Uh, through the foramen ovale. Now when we cord clamp, and especially if we immediately cord clamp after the baby's born, 
what happens is that placental circuit is taken away, that low resistance placental circuit, increasing the systemic blood pressure, which closes the foramen ovale, and now the blood returning from the body has to go through the right heart, and it has to go through the lungs to return to the left heart. But meanwhile, the lungs are filled with water, they're maybe not inflated yet, the baby's maybe not breathing yet, um, and yet this has to take over, the pulmonary vascular resistance is still high, and there's at least theoretically this moment of time where the left heart is not getting filled um, properly as the blood's making its way through the lungs. And that the heart, at this at least for this moments of time, is underfilled and having to work harder and maybe becoming tachycardic to make up for it. Now contrast that to this concept of physiology-based cord clamping, where Instead of clamping the cord immediately, we leave the placenta attached while we open up the lungs, while we start getting the baby breathing, while we have the baby um, starting to have their pulmonary vascular resistance drop. And in that case, the placenta is still attached. It's still re, um, uh, bringing oxygenated blood. It's still able to go through the foramen and fill the left heart. But meanwhile, the blood coming out of the right heart, more and more that blood is now going through the lungs instead of going through the ductus as the lung opens up, as the pulmonary vascular resistance falls. And now the lungs are able to supply some of the blood to the left heart so that now when we go from this state to cord clamping, the left heart's better positioned to be able to handle that switch over. The lungs are more in line, in circuit, ready to provide oxygenation before you clamp the placenta. So let's look at how that actually looks in some animal models. I want to spend a lot of time on some of these animal models because I think this is really great to understand the underlying physiology. So here we have, uh, uh, this is a fetal lamb, the lamb who's been delivered and he's instrumented in such a way we can get all these great measures of coronary artery pressure. We have pulmonary artery pressure, pulmonary blood flow, ductus arterial blood flow and coronary blood flow. I'm gonna ignore ductus blood flow uh, for the most part and we'll talk about these other four parameters. But this is a lamb who's been delivered, who's not been allowed to breathe, who's not breathing and the cord is clamped right here in this dashed line. And when that happens, you have this immediate increase within just a few heartbeats, this increase in carotid artery blood pressure. Notice the time scale is a very short time scale. Pulmonary artery pressure also goes up dramatically, but interesting with pulmonary ar artery pressure is you really don't get much increase in pulmonary blood flow. In fact, it looks very flat, maybe even dampened, even though you've clamped the cord and you need that pulmonary blood flow to happen. In contrast, the coronary artery pressure went up, the coronary blood flow went up as well after that clamping. Now, I'm gonna contrast that to a lamb who's now been delivered and he's been ventilated for several minutes before we come to the cord clamping here. This is still designated cord clamping, but now you see we've been ventilating all along. There's a slight increase in coronary artery pressure with a slight increase in coronary blood flow, but not as dramatic an increase in pressure. Pulmonary artery pressure already starting lower than over here, goes up slightly, but not much slightly. But with that slight increase in pulmonary blood pressure, there's actually now an increase in pulmonary blood flow that wasn't detectable over here when the lamb had been unventilated before that. And this is work out of uh, Stuart Hooper's lab, um, Dr. Bott's paper from 2013. Um, this is a larger time frame. That was a very short time frame. This is from that same study, but now we're looking at a four minute time frame. And I'm gonna walk you through this, uh, these graphs because they're a little, uh, they might be a little difficult to look at at first. This is carotid artery pressure and carotid, carotid artery flow. Let's focus on those two at first. Um, there's two interventions being shown here. And if you're in the filled circles, these are lambs that had their cord clamped first and then ventilated. So the two interventions, this is cord clamping, and then this is starting to breathe. And so if we look at coronary artery pressure, when we clamp the cord, the current carotid artery pressure goes up very high, but then it starts to fall as the baby's not breathing. Then we start ventilation and the, the carotid pressure goes up very um, dramatically after that. Uh, and the carotid blood flow sort of follows the same pattern when these filled circles. But now contrast that to the open circles where the lambs were delivered, they started ventilation first on this first intervention, and now the second intervention, two minutes later, they are now clamping the cord. And in that case, the coronary artery pressure is very stable. There's a little drop maybe here for the while ventilating, but then when the cord clamp, it does rise, it does increase, but it's very stable. And the coronary blood flow really looks same all throughout all this, this nice stable transition in coronary blood flow. And now maybe even more dramatic, let's go over here and look at the pulmonary blood flow. Now we have those lambs that have had their cord clamp first and then ventilated in these filled circles. There's no increase in pulmonary blood flow after clamping. Not until we start ventilating does the pulmonary blood flow go up. Now contrast with the animals who had their ventilation happen first and then cord clamp, the pulmonary blood flow is going up and up and up 
and then we clamp the cord and it goes up even further. And there's this dramatic difference at the end of four minutes. But not just at four minutes, if now we go out even for 30 minutes, we have this increase in pulmonary blood flow that's lasting out 30 minutes for these lambs who now, the open circles again still represents ventilate first, then clamp, compared to the filled circles where we clamped first and then we ventilated. Um, the carotid artery pressures uh, and carotid artery flow, not as dramatic, not as obvious a difference. There seems to be a little difference, but not statistically significant. Whereas the pulmonary pressure, pulmonary blood flow is very different uh, for these animals. So I think this is really impressive work. I think this is really helps me understand sort of the physiologic changes, but you might ask, well, does that matter in humans? What's the, what's the deal in humans? So we have our friends in the Netherlands to thank uh, for a study where they just look at their own cohort of patients, uh, shown here in both of these, um, where they routinely had midwives at delivery that most routinely clamped the cord around five minutes of life. And this is just showing a nomogram or the percentiles of the saturations for the first 10 minutes of life and the heart rate for the first 10 minutes of life. And I just want to focus on saturation for a second because what we're comparing it to is the defined reference range. This is the reference range. This is the data that places like our neonatal resuscitation program here in the United States or uh, the other programs around the world teaching neonatal, neonatal resuscitation use these guidelines to decide what SAT goals you should have. And I want you to think about this carefully because if you think about um, cord blood gases, when we look at cord arterial blood gases, routinely the saturations on the fetus before he's born, saturations are low, but they're routinely 50, 60, 70% saturation. And yet at one minute of life in our first, in our defined reference range normal, 25% of babies at the 25th percentile or 40% or less saturation. Why do we have this drop off in one minute later from birth from this 60% sat in the fetal, fetal life to this 40%? But now compare that if you do delayed cord clamping, if you wait until the baby's breathing while the placenta is still attached, you can just sort of imagine baby starting fetal life 40, 50, 60% here, just nicely going smoothly up instead of dropping off as you see in the defined reference range. So very different response, higher saturations in the group with delayed cord clamping. And if you look at heart rate, also very different, starting a bit lower, a nice smooth transition up. In the defined reference range, there's almost this overshoot of heart rate. So in the first few minutes, there's this large increase that eventually comes down. So very different looking heart rates uh, uh, pattern when we do delayed cord clamping compared to immediate cord clamping. Now, Dr. Anderson, Ola Anderson, also did a much larger trial. This is done in, uh, in, done in Nepal with about 1,200 babies. And I'm referencing uh, Dr. Anderson, who was the uh, corresponding author, because I have no idea how to say that last name um, as the primary author. Uh, but we're really indebted to this great paper where they did a lot of the same physiology numbers, but they put numbers to it at just the defined minute, one minute, five minute, and time minute, 10 minute time points for oxygen sats. We have the early clamping group here, which was they defined as less than 60 seconds. We have the delayed cord clamping group here, which is three minutes or more. And you can see at each time point, higher saturations in delayed cord clamping at one in five, 10 minutes. And the heart rate's lower at one in five minutes, doesn't reach significance, uh, they're the same by 10 minutes. Uh, but there's these differences. And I'm just going to camp here for a second, because if I look at my own textbook for neonatal resuscitation, it gives guidelines for our target saturations for these same time points, the one minute, five minute, and 10 minute. And just look at these ranges. So 60 to 65% at one minute of life as a target range. That's about the average and the early cord clamping group is at the low end of the range. That means about half of the babies would not have met this target range. However, in the delayed cord clamping group, even three standard deviations out, there's gonna be almost no babies that have not made this target range. That's a double negative there, but almost all of these babies are gonna have met that target range at one minute. And five minutes, maybe even more important, the average in the early cord clamping group doesn't even meet the lower end of the suggested range for the NRP guidelines. And this might be important because 80%, some authors have looked at, I know you may know there's a lot of debate about whether we should be starting with 21% oxygen for resuscitation on preterm babies, or should we be starting at higher oxygen saturations? In this, uh, in this term cohort, at least, more than half the babies aren't going to make that 80% target range. And at least some authors in preterm population have looked at that 80% at five minutes might be a definition for babies who are going to do well versus babies who aren't going to do well. So, um, but again, in the delayed cord clamping group, even three standard deviations out, 
almost all of these babies are going to make that target range. So maybe more important than what oxygen saturation you start with for resuscitation might be whether you do delayed cord clamping or not to make that target and those target ranges. Um, so this leads the authors and the people of Dr. Hooper and Dr. Kluckow who, uh, who believe in physiology-based cord clamping to make quotes like this. And what they're basically saying is that lung aeration, that starting of breathing, is that a main event that precipitates all the changes that we need to see happen for a good physiologic transition to ex uterine life. Um, and so um, that's based on that animal physiology data. You see a little bit of that human term physiology data, but I guess you could question, does it really matter in the end? Is this gonna make a difference? And I like this paper. I think this really is a helpful paper. So now this is a paper done in Tanzania on 15,000 babies. It was a retrospective cohort study. So they, because what they had been able to do is film almost every resuscitation that had happened at this hospital. And down here on the x-axis is the time, the time between when the baby first breathed and when the baby's cord was clamped. And it's listed in seconds. Um, but you notice you have negative numbers here. And that's because if you were to the left line, a negative nine, that means that you were clamped first before you started to breathe for this amount of time. But if you're onto the right side of the graph, that means you breathe first and then, you were, and then the cord was clamped. And then here on the y-axis, we have the proportion of babies and their primary outcome was either that died or that were admitted to the NICU. And these are low proportion of numbers, but these are still 15,000 babies, so you can maybe say something significant about what happens. They broke them up into both uh, less than 2,500 grams and greater than 2,500 grams uh, to kind of get at the different size babies. But what you notice here on the, on the left side, on those that had their cord clamped first, then breathe, just like we saw in those animal models, they didn't have as great a physiologic transition. In fact, they had a higher proportion of babies dying or being admitted on this side. But if you look at, as you go over to the, to the right side of the graph, for babies that at first were able to breathe before the clamping, they have lower percentage of babies dying or being admitted, a lower incidence of their primary outcome, which is good. But it's not just a simple yes or no. It seems to be that each additional second, the more seconds between those two events, had lower and lower and lower risk of being admitted or dying. Um, so I think this is fairly powerful evidence that this concept of physiologic-based cord clamping um, has real effects in real life. Um, so some of you are going to ask, you're going to say, well, that's all well and good for these term babies, these possibly late preterm babies, but my micropremies, I'm a neonatologist, there's no way this is going to work for them. I pulled this data I'm showing up here from two separate trials where they were randomizing trials, where they were doing delayed cord clamping, and if you look carefully in the data sets, you will find that they report the percentage of babies that were breathing before they clamped the cord. And in both these trials, they weren't trying to do anything to the babies. This is just the late cord clamping, the baby sitting there waiting till the time is up. 76% of, babe, 76 of babies 23 to 27 weeks in one study were spontaneously breathing before the cord was clamped. And another trial with slightly older gestational age, 92% of them were breathing before the cord was clamped. So you can do this in your preterm baby. You can expect that most of them are gonna breathe before you clamp the cord. Uh, now I want to talk a little bit about cord milking. That's not the focus of today, but I think the animal data here, again, is very informative. So this is Dr. Blank's study. This is, again, in Stuart Hooper's lab a couple years later. Um, so you should be used to this sort of graphs by now, as I showed you before. So this is umbilical cord flow. So this first line here is they've clamped the cord. So now, of course, there's no more umbilical cord flow. This is car carotid artery pressure, carotid artery blood flow clamp the cord, and then start breathing for the baby, start ventilation. And you see all the changes we've seen previously. Um, now here we are, physiology-based cord clamping. We've been breathing all along for this baby, and now we clamp the cord. There's normal blood flow, this nice, smooth transition in carotid artery, blood pressure, and blood flow. But now if we look at cord milking, and we're going to have it in two different ways. They did it without placental refill and with placental refill, and there's slight differences in what that means. But I'll just focus on the one over here with without placental refill. And what you see is these huge swings in carotid pressure, then low, then high, then low, then high, that falls with coronary artery blood flow. And when I look at that as a neonatologist, the first thing I think about is, whoa, I think, what are we looking at here? What, what a setup of uh, perfusion, reperfusion injury, lack of perfusion, ischemia, reperfusion. I just start to make me think of what a risk for IVH. And in fact, when I first saw this data for the first time, I started going immediately to my obstetric colleagues and saying, don't do cord milking, don't do cord milking. I was very nervous about this data. And that was even at a time where we actually have human data that at the time looked like cord milking wasn't that bad, might actually do some good things in our preterm populations. 
um, and it might be safe in our term population. But as many of you know, just this last year, uh, a, a trial was being done comparing cord milking delayed cord clamping. It had to be stopped early, although they reported on about 500 patients. Um, this came out just uh, last year with Dr. Katheria. Uh, and the reason it was stopped early is because of this line right here. Severe IVH rates in 23 to 27 weekers had a dramatic increase, 22% compared to 6% in the cord milking arm. Um, and this was highly significant. Uh, and so this trial was stopped early. Um, now, fortunately, that same safety issue wasn't seen in the 28 to 31 week study in the group. Um, and so this study is actually ongoing for continuing for this age range, but it has dropped out. They're no longer doing it in the 23 to 27 week range. The other thing, important thing to note on this, this is just uh, data straight from their paper that I put in my own table. But the any IVH rates were actually not different um, in the 23 to 27 weeks. So 37% com compared to 35%. So the actual risk with cord milking in this case appears to be not that it caused maybe IVH, but that it uh, made the IVH that the babies were prone to get more severe. Either way, it's not good. Um, it's not something we want for our uh, preterm babies. And so right now I'm very cautious about cord milking, but as this trial continues, we might get some more information that cord milking has its period, has its place, and there might be some issues where it's very safe. Um, so that's the animal physiology. I hope that prompts a lot of questions when we get to the question and answer page uh, part. But now I'm gonna talk a little bit about clinical evidence. Um, and I'm gonna kind of go through this fairly briefly, but um, uh, I hope I cover this fairly well. And I, I know I cover it in my video a bit more than this. Um, so benefits for term infants. Um, I'm just gonna kind of go over the ages. Most of the benefits that we talk about is improved iron stores and improved neural developmental outcomes. Um, and so here's two different trials here I'm pointing out. This one was done in, uh, in Rhode Island here in the United States, where they just looked at it four months of age. They had 20 second versus five minute cord clamping. Um, and they showed improved iron stores at four months of age. And they did MRI on all these babies and actually able to show improved brain myelination as well at four months. Um, another study, this is uh, Dr. Anderson's group uh, in Nepal again, looked at it at 12 months. Again, their early clamping is 60 seconds. Their delayed clamping, three minutes or more. And at 12 months of age, they did an ages and stages questionnaire scores, and they found less numbers of at-risk scores in their delayed cord clamping group with a number needed to treat between 10 and 14, quite reasonable numbers, very low numbers um, for, for possibly big impacts. Now that's at 12 months of age. But earlier, Dr. Anderson had actually looked out probably the farthest that I'm aware of, a four-year follow-up study. Now this was a randomized trial of early cord clamping versus delayed cord clamping done in Sweden. Um, with four-year follow-up, and they had about 64% follow-up of their 382 randomized participants, and I'm sure they got dinged by the reviewers for that follow-up rate, but I'm actually very impressed by that follow-up rate for four years, something that's very hard to do in the United States, um, and I think that's actually very good follow-up. And what you see in the graph here, they did three different measures of neural development outcomes. So there, in the paper, there's a lot of outcomes, a lot of sub-outcomes, a lot of things to look at. And this graph somewhat cherry picks the best results. You know, it does that a little bit. And what's shown here is the proportion of children with a neural developmental score below the normal range. So a low percentage is a good thing. That means less uh, kids below the normal range. Uh, and so on the y-axis, you have the percent of patients. And here for this one score in the uh, WPPSI uh, processing speed, uh, you notice in boys, there appears to be a lower percentage of boys below the normal score. Although this A refers to a p-value of 0 0.06, so not quite significant. Um, but these other ones are significant. They, are, they do meet the less than 0.05 threshold um, for the movement score here, boys, um, less boys below the normal score, the ages and stages questionnaire, less boys below the normal score and motor, motor score. Um, so I think you could uh, fault a little bit. I just said this graph is cherry picking a little bit, but I've looked at this uh, paper very carefully. I'd, I'd encourage you to do the same thing. Um, but if you look line by line by line by line through all these scores, there's no score where the early cord clamping looks like, oh, it's better for this one. Um, they're almost all either no difference or some that maybe trend towards looking better for delayed cord clamping that didn't quite meet significance as well. Um, but you really don't see any, any harm. And I think the other way to think about this, how amazing is this, that something that's basically free, that you do it three minutes at the time of birth, is having any impact at four years of age is amazing in and of itself. And I think this is something that we're seeing a huge benefit for such little cost. It's something we really need to be considering um, how we can do this more often. Now for preterm babies, you can't get around talking without talking about the uh, Australian placental transfusion study. 
it's the largest study out there. It's a randomized control trial on less than 30 weeks gestation. They had immediate cord clamping less than 10 seconds versus delayed cord clamping greater than 60 seconds. 1,500 babies enrolled. That's an amazing number, huge outcome. But it had this uh, primary outcome, which was a composite outcome. So all the problems that we get with composite outcomes, because it was death and all these other major morbidities, and the primary outcome was no difference. Really a very disappointing trial in some ways, just this no difference uh, outcome. Um, but just, that's not how we look at trials, right? You know, the, 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 uh, the purists would tell us, we just put this one in the trash bin, there's no difference, no more to look at here. Um, but of course, most of us look at all the secondary outcomes and we try to learn something more. Um, and when we did that, of course, the second, one of the secondary outcomes, a really important one, mortality, death, was lower in the group that had received delayed cord clamping. And in fact, if we go and do a meta-analysis of all the papers done, we're gonna see that that holds true. So what I'm showing you down here is there's two different meta-analysis. I'm showing you the risk ratio scores. The first uh, meta-analysis was actually done by many of the authors from the Australian placental transfusion study. But then a second group um, in the Cochrane database uh, has done a second um, um, meta-analysis. And I'm just showing you the forest plots from the Cochrane Library uh, paper. Um, and what you see here, I want to point out, this one with the large box, as you guys are familiar looking these know, the weight of a particular study is sort of represented by the size of the box. And this is the Australian placental transfusion study. And look at the amount of weight it imposes on everything else. There's almost no other study that has any weight in this meta-analysis. And that's because it's such a large study. But just like in that one study, it was a uh, uh, improved mortality. When you do the meta-analysis, the risk ratio is below. It doesn't cross one. So it favors having better survival rates, less mortality with delayed cord clamping in preterm babies. Now, the other one that was really promising was, was any ventricular hemorrhage, IVH. Um, so again, this is the forest plot from the Cochrane Library. Um, before this, there was a lot of belief that uh, IVH rates were gonna be less with delayed cord clamping. The Australian placental transfusion study itself, here it is again, this big box, it crossed one. It was not significant in that trial. And when you looked at that secondary outcome, um, no matter which way you split it, IVH, severe IVH, none of those were better in the, um, in the Australian placental transfusion study. When you put it with all the other papers, even though they have very little weight, you come right up to the line at one. And the Cochrane Library, it doesn't quite, quite cross one, so it considered significant. Whereas in the uh, first meta-analysis, it touches one, uh, showing that it's maybe not significant. So I think the jury's a little bit still out on IVH, uh, but nonetheless, um, this was one of those uh, hoped for benefits that depending how you look at it, may or may not improve IVH rates with delayed cord clamping for preterm babies. So I think you could look at this clinical evidence and you could ask yourself, so for term babies, they get this benefit of placental transfusion, which increases their iron stores, and that gives them the better long-term outcomes. Um, but the preterm babies, they get that benefit of the stable birth transition, which decreases death rates and maybe plus or minus IVH rates, and that gives them better short-term outcomes. Is that right? Is that what we're really talking about here? And I don't think so. I think the term babies do get the benefit of the stable birth transition, but you're not gonna see it with death rates and IVH rates. In fact, we saw that with those term studies where they looked at the, the 10 minutes of saturations and heart rate. It does make a difference. But what type of outcomes and what type of impact that's going to have early on, it, it's kind of hard to know what studies, what things to look at, where to look at on that. Um, but I, I have no doubt that it is helping with that uh, birth transition, but it just may not be showing up in ways that we're able to measure. And vice versa, if we look at the preterm babies, I think there's no reason to expect that they're not getting the benefit of placental transfusion and iron stores as well, but whether they have better neural development outcomes, that's gonna depend on a lot of things like IVH rates, it's gonna depend on transfusion um, thresholds, it's gonna depend on the number of blood draws and lab draws you do at your particular institution. So I think it's gonna be hard to show better neo neural developmental outcomes from, from this intervention. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to look, and in fact, some people are looking. So this is a paper that just came out, well, uh, last week. Uh, so, you know, I try to keep up to date. I try to give uh, new information, but this was printed last week. Um, this is uh, looking at neural developmental outcomes. This was a um, randomized trial of babies less than 32 weeks gestational age. Um, in one arm, they were giving delayed cord clamping, but greater than two minutes versus immediate less than 20 seconds. And it's not just delayed cord clamping. We're not talking about just leaving a baby there, twiddling our thumbs while the baby's trying to breathe. We're talking about greater than two minutes with neonatal care while the cord was still intact. So 
slightly different than just delayed cord clamping like it was done in the Australian trial where the babies were just um, uh, warmed and dried and, and not otherwise uh, intervened upon. Um, but nonetheless, their main follow-up, their primary outcome was death or adverse neural developmental outcomes at two years of age. So this is important neural developmental follow-up and it was called the CORD pilot trial. They, they, they um, published their protocols online ahead of time. 21% um, outcome versus 34% outcome in the uh, delayed group, which was significant improvement um, in their primary outcome by delayed cord clamping. Um, and then if you split the two parts of the composite outcome out, death again appears to be significant, although it just touches one, so you can't quite say it's significant. Um, but here's the important point here, the adverse neural developmental outcomes, whether by the Bailey 3 or the Ages and Stages questionnaire, a decreased percentage of babies having this uh, negative outcome, 14% compared to 18%. And while this doesn't reach significance alone, it certainly wasn't powered for the subsets of this outcome, um, but I'm encouraged that they're both going in the same direction. You know, we run into problems with composite outcomes where one part of the composite causes less and one causes more. They're both going in the same direction. And I think this starts to give us some hope that we can show that delayed cord clamping may actually have neural developmental benefits for preterm babies as well. Obviously more work needs to be done, but this is an encouraging start. All right, um, so that's the clinical evidence. I know I gave that a bit of a short, uh, short section. We can talk a lot more about that, I'm sure, in the questionnaire, but now I wanna talk a little bit about implementation. And for that, I'm gonna talk a little bit more personally about how we implemented it here at Texas Children's Hospital. Um, because I've actually done quite a bit of work with quality improvement with communication between our obstetric and our uh, neonatology colleagues. And I gotta tell you, these two papers here are some of the hardest work I've ever done. Just trying to get people to talk to each other, just trying to get people to tell me why I'm there for the delivery. One of the toughest things I've ever done. Um, and it's very difficult uh, work to get people communicating well. Um, and these two papers go through that poor, hard, arduous process that we did. But we also did a survey, Dr. Gotham and I here, um, and we asked around uh, hospitals in the North America how they did their handoff in the delivery room. We actually asked about all sorts of other times of communication between obstetrics and neonatology. But the interesting information we got, off about the, got out about the handoff information is we asked them who gives the information. When you show up in the delivery room, who's giving you the information of why you're there? We're asking the neonatologist this. Half the time it was somebody from nursing. It was only a rare hospitals that reported that it was the, the obstetrician did that. 21% of the hospitals reported it was the obstetrician giving the information. And a lot of hospitals, about a fourth of them said, there really was no specific person that gave that information. It was just sort of each time a little bit different who did that. We also asked them if they use a script. It was a minority of hospitals that use a script. But as you see over here in the graph, um, the ones that did use a script more often said they got all the information they needed versus those that didn't, get, didn't use a script. So scripts can be a useful part of of uh, the handoff process, as we, we know from multiple other areas of study. Um, but this is sort of where we were at when, when thinking about this, this was about two years ago. Um, we were looking at the evidence, I was looking at the evidence for delayed cord clamping, and I kept being more and more impressed about how the delayed cord clamping was improving outcomes. And uh, I was talking to some of my other colleagues in neonatology, and I was frustrated because I didn't know how to get our obstetrician group on board. In fact, what if you may not know this, but in the Australian placental transfusion study, we were one of the sites for that study. In fact, three of the co-authors on that paper are some of my colleagues. And I assumed that when we did that trial, we would just really start taking off because you know how when you do a trial, sometimes you really learn from it and you start implementing it even before the trial's out because you, you're, you start to see the benefits of it. But that never happened at my institution. And so um, we went from never seeing it done about two years ago to where just this uh, couple months ago with one of my uh, obstetric colleagues, Dr. Uh, Jennifer Bump, we wrote a blog post about why is delayed cord clamping the new normal here at Texas Children's? And it was a blog post for moms looking on the website. Um, but now we can say that together. So how did we get here? How did we get to the point where we can sort of call it the new normal? And I'll tell you, it started with this question. Because as I was sitting around with one of my friends, Dr. Ganga Gokulakrishnan, I was talking about how, I was, how can we get this going? And she said to me, you know what, Nathan, what I've started to do is just ask them when I get into the delivery room, is there any reason we can't do delayed cord clamping? And I said, Ganga, you're brilliant. I'm stealing from you. I'm stealing that from you right now uh, because I thought that is a brilliant question. I'm going to use that every time I'm in the delivery room. So I was probably in the delivery room about a week later. 
And I had to muster up the courage to talk because, you know, we never talk. The, the nurses give us the information. We never talk to the obstetrician and all that poor communication problems. So I had to kind of muster up the courage and I didn't know his name. So a hey, hey, doctor, um, hey, what do you think? Is this a baby we can do delayed cord clamping on? And he turned around and he just looked at me side eyed and said, no. And that was the end of the conversation. It was the worst start to, to a QI project. But, but I got to say, that was the only time that ever happened. Every other obstetrician I asked was so inviting when I asked them that question. They were, many of them were amazed. They're like, oh, you would actually think that's a good idea. I didn't think you guys were on board with that. Or you would have questions about, oh, I didn't think that was proven to be good. And I could give them the evidence. Well, yes, it is actually been shown in this study, in this study. And it opened up a world. And it was, in, I would say, in contrast, one of the easiest QI projects that I ever did. Now, I don't have formal control charts to show you. I don't have formal ways. Of, we didn't track it that way. It just sort of happened more organically by starting to ask this question, encouraging our neonatology colleagues to ask this question. We started giving lectures to the OB department. We gave lectures to our neonatal department and we just gave the evidence and we just talked about why it's good and it started taking off like wildfire um, to the point where again, I think we can say it's pretty routine here. But now that doesn't mean we have, we're, we're done. We have work to do. We're not there in terms of some of these other more um, invasive uh, resuscitation methods while still attached to the cord. But I'm encouraged again that other people are working on that sort of thing because now they're at the point where the evidence is there. Now we got to get to the point where we're, in, we're actually putting it into effect. We're implementing it. We're using quality improvement efforts. So this is a paper from last month uh, put online. So again, I'm trying to stay up to date for you guys. Um, this is a quality improvement effort in England where they were trying to do delay cord clamping for two minutes. They were uh, looking at all their babies less than 32 weeks. Now they used a Life Start trolley, which was supposed to be their go-to place for doing delayed cord clamping. And this is just a device that allows you to sort of roll it up close to the mom so the baby can be attached to the cord. It has the oxygen tanks. It has the, the resuscitation devices so that you can begin whatever the baby needs in those first few minutes of life for those two minutes while you're waiting for cord clamping. Uh, I'd love, I know that people in the Netherlands would love me to mention uh, Concord Neonatal is another group that's making a device that does the exact same thing. Um, I've only seen it online. They all look very good. I don't have any personal um, uh, experience with either of these. Um, but what they did for their interventions in terms of the quality improvement, their PDSA cycles, they started doing case reviews. Why wasn't delayed cord clamping done in this, in this particular case? And they sort of found a lot of processes and issues around who gets the life start trolley ready? Who brings it into the room? Who has it, who has it ready? Who, who does this? Who holds? Who, and, they, and finding all these processes, they were able to start to put out a lessons of the week. And each week they'd put out a lessons of the week um, to show uh, what they had learned about why it wasn't being done and could communicate that to their, to their institution. What you see is they had a very a dismal starting point of not doing delayed cord clamping on a percentage of those eligible for delayed cord clamping, because not every baby is eligible. There are some reasons not to do it, uh, but of those eligible, you see this nice quality improvement project increasing to where uh, in the last month, two of the last three months, they were able to get 100% of babies. Uh, they also did another, another graph in the study shows that um, early on, even when they were doing cord clamping, they were only using the Life Start trolley about 10% of the time. By the end, they were using about 90% of the time. So they were actually able to improve one of the processes along the way as well. But another thing you might need to do uh, is look at sort of the ergonomic challenges. You might have to sit down and you're really thinking about implementing this and figure out how can we do this? And ergonomics is that idea of just how do you fit people around a space? How do you put them in the right spot? Who does what? And this is a paper from uh, uh, Dr. Henry Lee in Stanford. And they just did simulations and they just put uh, diagrammed out, where would the scrub tech be? Where would the OBs be? Where would the neo team be in both the situation of a C-section or in a vaginal birth? And they actually had couple different options of layout and they just went in the simulation lab and simulated this with uh, with participants and out of that they took uh, they took notes and they took all the different topics that came up all these different identified challenges and there's a long list so this is a great paper if you're thinking about implementing go read this and look at what the challenges already designated are you might need to do it in your institution as well to figure out hey what are those challenges for me personally what are my challenges in my hospital but thinking about how are we going to deal with sterility Who's going to bring the equipment? Where's the equipment going to be? Um, how mobile is it is? How are we going to have enough space? This is a lot of people to fit around a bedside. Um, and how are we going to do all that? And how are we going to communicate well? Um, and so those are some of the things you need to think about as you're thinking about implementing it. Um, I hope I didn't go too long. That's sort of my uh, uh, sort of early start here at the webinar. Um, I think it's time to open up for questions. 
uh, let other people chime in. Uh, just say if you have other platforms, you're welcome to reach me these way uh, once we're offline, um, both by uh, Twitter or my, uh, again, my YouTube channel or uh, LinkedIn, and you can directly email me uh, and my Texas Children's uh, address. So I'm gonna stop there and let other people start chiming in. So thank you so much, Nathan, for a great presentation. Uh, and uh, let me just uh, take away this uh, <laughs> screen sharing. Oh, sorry about this. Okay, so let's open up the question and answers uh, panel. Uh, and we are also have quite a lot of questions in the chat window. Uh, would you like to start, Francesco? Yes, so I'll start off with uh, questions that are at, in COVID times very prominent. So do you see any contraindications for delayed cord clamping from your side? And how about patients with uh, history of COVID-19? How would you deal with that? Well, I can say at our institution, we're, we're, we've put delayed cord clamping off the, off the table, off the options for COVID positive moms or, or moms under investigation at this time. Um, I'd love to say I, I, it, it's hard to know. There, it's confusing information whether there is vertical transmission or not, uh, but that would be a period of time where the baby would be in contact with the mom. Um, I give under, under these uncertain times, I think that's sort of a, a trade-off um, I think we sort of have to be willing to make. Uh, I don't think there would be wrong to make the other decision and to say, hey, this is important and um, maybe we should continue to do this for these particular patients. Um, but at this point, that's at least what our institution has chosen. But uh, are there any other contraindications that you would regard uh, for delayed court clamping? Yeah, I think, you know, the, we have the, in 2017, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology put out a, a, a statement paper and it lists the, the, uh, the contraindications pretty well. I, I, just for my brain, I have to sort of categorize it. Um, you know, I, I put it as when the, when the placenta stinks, when the placenta is no good, there's not much point in doing delayed cord clamping. So moms with severe hypertension and babies with uh, severe IUGR, maybe not a good baby to be doing on. Um, placental abruption, if, it's no, if the placenta is no longer attached, you might be able to get blood out of the placenta, but you're certainly not getting oxygen. That baby needs to start breathing and you need to start resuscitating if they're not already. Um, and the other big category um, is if there's bleeding and issues in health to the mother. Um, so if the mother, um, is, is not in a stable state, um, that's certainly, we can't, we can't help the baby to, to, to hurt mom. Um, and so that's sort of really the other one. Or if the baby himself is having severe D cells before the delivery, saying the baby's in trouble. Um, unless you're willing to be hands in and actually resuscitating the baby while attached to the cord, you're probably not gonna be able to just wait a minute or more um, while the baby sits there. Okay, great, thanks. Um, I think one of the issues, is, especially with preterms, is how do you do temperature stabilization, ideally? Or what, what tricks do you use that uh, children don't cool out too much? Yeah, I think that's a big one. And I, uh, this is like, again, we're still a work in progress, um, but we became concerned about that from the neonatology side. We actually did do uh, more of a formal investigation, a QI project to look at, you know, where the babies we're receiving delayed cord clamping versus not in our preterms, were they showing up more cold to our NICU? And we really couldn't see any particular signal that they were. But I'll tell you, I can say the obstetricians, when you first told them that the baby's gonna be holding a minute, I had to remind them what you do in the first minute with the baby, because they did all sorts of things they shouldn't be doing. Um, I, my, one of my favorites was in the scrub tech. I said, can you dry the baby off? Um, dipped one of the towels in water and uh, started rubbing the baby down with wet towel. And I thought, well, okay, you're trying. Um, uh, but, you know, we had to work with them. And, and, and they had towels, but they have those really rough OR towels. And so we finally had to work to get a, a towel in the kit that's a nice softer blanket so we're not scratching up the preemie baby skin when they're drying them off for us. Um, so we had to do some work in talking about that. And so maybe some of those efforts have been good. That one trial that did the preterm outcomes for two years neural developmental follow-up, 
um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm taking the QI project that was looking at increasing the number of ones where they were doing delayed cord clamping. They actually admit at the end that they actually saw a lower temperature on the babies getting delayed cord clamping. And they were instituting a new QI project to try to increase that um, and improve that by, by using even a, a, a thermal mattress with even older gestational age, getting them in the plastic uh, ponchos. So I do think that's something you got to think about, especially in the preterm babies, about keeping them warm, how you're going to do that, whether they're laying on mom's abdomen or are they on a device um, with a warmer on it. The trolleys, I don't think have a, they don't have an overhead warmer. They have a warmer. Um, I think there's a, a warming ability in the, in the pad. Um, the Concord neonatal version does actually have a warmer that goes over the baby with an arm that sort of extends out close to the mom. There are a few special cases in the questions. So what about delayed cord clamping in twins? And uh, is there something that needs to be considered for uh, RH negative pregnancies? I mean, blood group uh, questions. Would you consider delayed cord clamping in also the, those situations? So again, I kind of go to the ACOG statement. They don't really strongly come down one way or the other on twins, as I remember it. Um, I think monochorionic twins, I think is a reasonable one to say that the core wrapping that, again, maybe you don't want to do it in those situations. Um, but I've certainly many times done it with twins. Um, some of the OBs pull them out one at a time, wait for delayed cord clamping, and then pull out the other, other than sort of have them, two or three of them all laying out on moms, add them in at the same time, uh, keeping track of who's had a minute so far in each. Um, and uh, I think it's definitely doable um, with twins. But again, that's one of those ergonomic challenges. It might be a time to really sit down and say, okay, um, where are we gonna put the baby? How are we gonna do this? Let's talk about this together, uh, about what way we need to do this. The other question about RH uh, negative, um, I don't think that's a contraindication. I think, uh, again, um, if the baby has more blood, that's more blood to break down and get jaundice from. Um, and that's actually one of the risks we didn't talk about. And I, I think some ways it's sort of easy to take that risk and go, well, big deal. Right? I'm just going to give phototherapy. These babies get a little more jaundiced and, and that's not, it's not hard to treat. But I do think there's more and more evidence coming out that phototherapy itself is not completely benign. Um, it has potential, at least in one study, a large cohort from uh, Kaiser Permanente here in uh, California. Um, babies that received phototherapy had higher incidence of childhood seizures. Um, I don't totally know what to make of that. Um, there's concern in the pre in the micro micro preemies that that it might increase death rates with uh, phototherapy too aggressive. So phototherapy is not nothing, but that's one of the main risks. And the other main risk I would say for preterm babies especially, preterm baby risk would be um, uh, not getting resuscitation that you need. So if the baby's sitting over for a minute, not breathing, the heart rate's less than 100, that's not a good situation at all. And that's a risk you're taking waiting for those babies to breathe. But again, 76, 92% of those babies will breathe before you clamp the cord um, with just stimulation. And maybe even better if you can be in there helping them start breathing with, uh, with ventilation devices. Sorry, my, might I just interrupt? Uh, this is Ola Andersson. Uh, I was... Uh, no, I didn't hear you, Stefan. Uh, sorry, I just want to say that Ola Andersson, he's Mr. Cord Clamping in Europe. Yes. Well, I just, I, just, I just wanted to comment on the RH immunizations. There are actually a study published on this. And they, they showed there were no complications, there were no more jaundice in the, in the delayed clamping group, and there was of less, uh, less uh, transfusion, blood transfusion. So they could only see uh, positive uh, things by, by doing delayed cord clamping and RH immunization. So I wouldn't say that as a contraindication. And as, I just want to comment about the I, IUGR also, Nathan, uh, that I think also you should be, it could be a, a, a contraindication, but there is only one study from South Africa on uh, uh, small progestational age babies and they couldn't see any problems with uh, polycythemia in a higher degree in the in the SGA babies and delayed cord clamping. I kind of agree. We don't we don't automatically exclude IEGR babies either, but we do. You know, they are a little higher risk for needing resuscitation. And since at least at now at this point, we're not in there resuscitating the baby before the cords clamp. Um, uh, we're just we're just 
case by case basis, we're making sure the baby looks out, comes out, is breathing, moving well, has good tone, um, and making those decisions on a case by case basis. So I guess it's at least one that you need to maybe be a little more thoughtful on. Great. Uh, I have a very basic question. Uh, if you talk about delayed cord clamping, what time are you actually looking at? Are you saying like, do we need like half a minute, a minute, two minutes? When is it good enough? Or what, what are you aiming for? Well, no matter what I say, I'm going to get in trouble with somebody. Um, there's somebody's going to not like the answer. Uh, I think right now, um, what we're aiming for is, is 60 seconds. That's what I want out of a baby where I'm not doing any interventions on. And I partly say that because if I'm in the room, presumably there's something at a higher risk for the baby to have a problem. If I'm not in the room and you want to go longer than that, I'm all for it. Uh, but if I'm in the room, it's because I'm a neonatologist. It's because you're expecting a problem. Uh, and, I, and, and at this moment, I think preterm babies, that minute, that's the best studied um, and until we get to the point where we're, we're actually scrubbed in and we're there with the neopuffs giving the baby breaths, I don't think I can really give more time than that. Now, if you have a term baby who's screaming his head off and looking comfortable and you're keeping warm on mom's abdomen, I think you probably should go longer. And I would say the evidence there, and Dr. Anderson knows this way better than me, uh, but the evidence there is essentially by three minutes, you've probably got the maximum amount of placental transfusion out of the placenta from the blood. Uh, into the baby. Um, and so now the further benefits probably aren't really there after three minutes. Um, the midwives uh, tend to use cord palpations, or I've seen a new hashtag going around, wait for white. Uh, and there's the idea that when you see no more blood in the cord, there's no more blood going back and forth. So again, you now know that you've gotten the maximal benefit out of the placental transfusion. And I, I'm fine with all of those. Uh, I think you may not need to go more than three minutes, but if you want to go five minutes, I do get a little creeped out when they do the ones with the uh, the lotus burst where they leave the baby attached to the placenta until it shrivels away two days later. Um, I'm not a fan of that one, um, but I'm not really uh, concerned about if you want to go longer than three minutes. Great. Um, so, and when you argue with uh, your gynecologists, what arguments do you often are you confronted with, and what is your uh, way of talking them into doing uh, the <laughs> same thing? Well, I think our our obstetric colleagues are great, and and I don't think I would have any argument other than that first time where the guy just said no to me. Um, it's just always been a great conversation and a time. I, I think there's been confusion, especially early on. They just weren't aware of the data, um, and I. Fortunately for me, I had looked very carefully into the data. I at least had some evidence to give back. And I certainly don't know everything. I continue to learn and, and, and I'm able to bring that information to that. They kind of know me as the, so I'm not the European uh, cord clamping expert, but I, I'll take for Texas Children's, I'm the cord clamping guy. And I know this is true because I was just on service last month with uh, one of the residents and she happened to be pregnant. When our obstetrician came back to me the next day and she said, we had, we had been discussing about delayed cord clamping and how does it work and what do you do? And I, I showed them my video and they watched my video. And she told me, she came back after obstetric appointment. She said, said you know, Dr. Sunger, I, I, I saw my OB yesterday and I told him I want delayed cord clamping. And she said, the first word out of the OB math was, which NICU doctor are you on service with? And she said, I gave him your name and she just started laughing and said, well, of course we can do that. Right, so, so they know, they know I'm, I'm, I'm kind of passionate about this. I think it's uh, an important step to do, but, um, but that also makes me a resource. And occasionally when we get questions, they, they know that I can, I'm, I'm willing to answer about situations of what might be a problem. And at this point now, I, you know, I gotta admit, that question is still my go-to to get the conversation rolling, but two in the morning I'm there, sometimes I don't ask it, I forget. And uh, I, I'm, I'm more and more often the OBs are asking me. You know, they're, they're, they're turning around saying, oh, hey, you want us to do co delayed cord clamping? And that, when I started to hear that question being asked to me, I knew we were on, I knew we were making traction. I knew we really had it then. There was one uh, interesting question here, uh, a more philosophical question. Would you regard it ethical to make more research with immediate cord clamping in one arm? And if so, in what? cohort or group of babies? 
Uh, that's a good one. And I, I'm certainly not in charge of the research world, but I would have a hard time personally, if somebody came to me with a study here and said, one of the arms is going to be immediate cord clamping. I don't think there's equipoise there. I, I don't think, I don't think I would be able to sign on to a, a study where one of the arms was immediate cord clamping. I think there's other things to learn about delayed cord clamping, maybe the time, again, the ergonomic challenges. I, I wanted to put in the implementation section of this webinar because I really think that's more where we're at. I think we're not at the study and learn more about it. Yes, there's, there's more to know about cord milking. Yes, time, oh, there's a ton of questions I guess you could say about how to do delayed cord clamping, but whether to do it versus immediate cord clamping, I've certainly lost equipoise. I would say you, you have to start working on how to implement it um, and follow the evidence that's already there. I, I was just looking at the poll. I mean, almost 65% uh, of the attendees has uh, responded to the poll. And um, uh, the first question was about the optimal timing. And it seems that uh, the attendees regard it uh, slightly differently uh, around the world. Uh, about half of the responders suggest 60 seconds as a good timing and uh, the other half uh, three minutes or longer. So that's interesting. Uh, do you have any comment about that, Nathan? No, I think it just goes again that I, 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 I kind of threw, <clears throat> excuse me, kind of threw that question, you guys, and I told you the correct answer is I have no idea. The correct answer is maybe any one of those is right. I, I think at this point, while my goal might be for that great placental transfusion for three minutes or more, um, uh, I think you have to take it case by case basis and the right amount for that particular baby in front of me might actually be immediate. You know, if the baby's depressed, not breathing, very depressed, and I don't have the ability to resuscitate them over there for that baby. I, while I think there's a lot of benefits to delayed cord clamping for that baby, immediate cord clamping is the right one. Mm -hmm. um, and for my micro preemies, it's definitely not cord milking, but a minute is maybe all I can afford uh, to give over there and delayed cord clamping. For my term baby who's healthy and well, I really hope I'm not even in the room and I hope the baby's going three, four, five minutes on that cord. If, I'm, if I might interrupt again, I, I would say, uh, I would agree uh, a lot with you, Nathan. And I, I should say that thank you for a really great presentation. Uh, but uh, uh, my experience for delayed cord clamping in the preterm is that uh, you really want to put on the knee puff. Uh, or uh, to give some CPAP because sometimes they see me, the obstetricians, oh, it's Ola Anderson, and you know, let's wait. And they wait for like two minutes. And then we have the baby when it comes to the table for the resuscitation table that has quite difficulties in breathing. And I, and so, so I really, I have to, to ask the obstetricians to, to, uh, to clamp the cord earlier. So if we could have the live start table or something else giving, giving CPAP early on uh, in, the, in, the, in the operation table or bedside, that then we could wait for the clamping. And we, we, we have started a study on uh, immediate or a resuscitation with an intact cord uh, in term babies. And then, uh, then there is, uh, of course, possibilities if you can give the resuscitation measures early. But I, I really want to stress for if there is a lot of people listening now that the Nepal studies that we did, we, we compared one minute with three minutes and we reduced iron deficiency with 40% eight month, at eight months of age by, by uh, waiting two minutes more. So for the term babies, I'm really sure that, that there is a, an extra benefit if you wait longer, especially if you put the baby directly on the belly because in the Swedish study, we put the baby um, for 30 seconds below uh, the vagina. So we would even enhance the transfusion. But if you put the baby up on the belly, you know that the transfusion takes a little bit longer, wi uh, longer while. And there is uh, studies both in, um, uh, yeah, old studies and newer studies that it can take up to five minutes to, to, uh, to, for the transfusion to be complete. Yeah, I think those are great points. And I think uh, the idea of being able to resuscitate, 
that actually would allow you a whole new um, group of patients that right now you can't even consider. So I think one of those is in the horizon is diaphragmatic hernia patients. Um, if you have a diaphragmatic hernia, we supposedly need to immediately intubate. Well, um, how can I do that if the baby's still attached to the cord or you're gonna have to clamp early? Um, but there are at least, uh, there's one published trial. It's more of just a feasibility trial, but a feasibility trial nonetheless to show you can, you can intubate a baby while they're still attached to the cord, start the resuscitation and then clamp the cord in a diaphragmatic hernia. And we might start seeing more and more of those. And I'm especially intrigued by that because one of those main benefits of delayed cord clamping in that physiology was increased pulmonary blood flow. And isn't that one of the main problems we have our diaphragmatic hernias is all these high pulmonary blood pressures and pulmonary blood flow. And what if, what if we could find a way to do delayed cord clamping with them? Um, could we get that benefit out of them? And you're not gonna find that in that short, small feasibility trial, but that's the types of things they're looking at. I'd love to see the full trial come out with that. And I question, and I, this is way, way out there. I know it, I know it. Um, but I would say, I question if there isn't some diaphragmatic hernias with low enough risk factors that you could even do more traditional delayed cord clamping and still just delay your resuscitation by 30 seconds to a minute and still get some benefits in that pulmonary blood flow. I wouldn't encourage that at all, um, but in some rare uh, extreme circumstances, we've sort of had to do that where um, the team got there late and we had to, it was better for the baby to be attached to the placenta than us trying to clamp and, and not have supplies ready. So, I mean, th there might be some other things that can be done but that's something on the horizon as well. Okay, thank you so much, Meta. I think we have now reached uh, the hour and uh, I would oh. like to begin saying a big thank you to you, Meta, for preparing the talk and uh, sharing uh, in this first ever webinar in the 99 Nikkei community. And uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I hope we will uh, see you again uh, later and uh, uh, the webinar is recorded. Uh, we we tried to post it live on Facebook, but I don't think it worked. But it will be available. Uh, we will post it on YouTube and then share it on the website, so it can be seen again. And um, uh, if there are follow-up questions, <clears throat> I suppose uh, those can also be discussed on the website uh, 99nikki.org. Well, I'm honored that you guys let me be the first webinar and I just thank you so much for the opportunity and I, I, I do hope it was informative and I encourage everybody that was a part of it, uh, feel free to contact me and um, I'm happy to share what I know. Um, uh, just uh, point you in the right directions more than anything. Okay, thank you so much and okay. see you next time. Bye, out there. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>